Okay, rest in peace, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, the longest serving queen uh, for the British Empire. Well, uh, good morning and welcome to Bazaar Morning Call. I am Anuj and with me, Sonia and Nigel. And of course, uh, in a market which is looking so strong uh, that you know you wonder whether uh, you know people need anyone to tell them anything. Yeah. You know, it's just uh, been so strong, just one way. If you look at what's uh, happened globally, there's a very strong momentum. And of course, India has been having a momentum of its own. Not that the global queues uh, are making too much of a difference, but uh, you know it doesn't hurt if the global queues are positive, of course. Uh, for me, the key highlight was the fact that uh, despite what uh, the Fed Chair Powell had to say about containing inflation, uh, I think the, the statement that stood out was that uh, it won't co cause deep recession. Why is that important? Is because remember, in the 1980s, uh, the US had to hit double-digit uh, interest rates and that really led to collapse of the economy maybe this time things will be different and that's what the market seems to believe and that's why there's a rally in fact the interest rate hikes 75 basis point rate hikes no longer scare the market which is clearly telling you that uh, uh, this is uh, maybe a bit of a fresh bull run india of course has been the best performing market and it looks like that outperformance will be extended today and uh, we might have another gap up of 100 points or so Absolutely. Morning. morning, Anuj. Morning, Nigel. And the equity cult is back, right? I mean, you can see it everywhere around you yeah. as well. You go out, you meet your friends, you meet your relatives, you meet even domestic staff and all they're asking you is, you know, what stock to buy, what trade to do. So at that point in time, of course, I mean, one can even talk about perhaps euphoric moods and maybe some, uh, you know, uh, overheating of the market. I don't know about that, but I do know for a fact that anyone and everyone is now interested in entering equity markets. And you can see it with the number of DMAT accounts that have opened up as well. It was a strong week for the U.S. markets too. So, so far, the U.S. markets, the Dow is up about 1.4%, S&P 500 up 2%, NASDAQ as well. And overnight too, we had some good cues from across the U.S. markets. The Fed chairman though is very strongly committed to uh, you know, bringing down inflation. And in that context, um, a lot of expectations have now risen to 75 basis points. Um, as far as the rate hike is concerned on the 20th and 21st of September from the Fed. So just keep that in mind as well. Large buying once again from FIs, 2,900 crores is what has come through. Uh, the DIs have sold a tad bit. So Anish, that brings us to this question, right? This uh, decoupling that we've been talking about, the outperformance that India has seen, is that a trend that can last through the course of the FOMC meeting till the end of the month? Well, it's lasted uh, for nine months, so it, it could very well do. Uh, Sonia, I'll repeat the point I made yesterday as well. The risk in this market is booking too soon. Because, you know, I remember day before when the SGX Nifty was down about 200 points, and I was making this point that that day was perhaps the best day from the risk reward point of view to take longs. The day's low that day was 17,485. And today we could be testing 18,000 in three days flat. So, once you get a good entry after that, the only thing that you got to do is trail your stops. And how do you do that? Uh, I think you make previous days low as your, as your stop. Uh, now, this is where things get tricky. I mean, if you're a day trader, then what do you do? Because uh, at some point, the ones who got in earlier would want to book some profit. So, uh, but this is a forgiving market. I mean, even if you buy at highs, two or three days later, the market will bail you out. Even if you have to go through some bit of mark to market. Uh, the other internal is the FII stats in the derivatives market. Yesterday, the shorts were cut by 9,100 contracts, but we are still at 76% net short uh, for, on index futures, uh, which means that, again, perhaps there's a lot more short covering, which is still to happen, unless, of course, things change drastically. Now, this rising 20-day exponential moving average has really been uh, the sacrosanct number. It's really provided a very good sort of uh, stop for positional bulls. It's now moved up to 17,520. I know it's a bit deep, but again, it's for those who got in early, not for those who are chasing the market. Uh, in terms of upside, 17,950 to 18,050. If you see the chart of the Nifty, 18,050 was the previous closing top and 17,950 was the top just, I think, uh, last month or thereabout. That now remains the last resistance zone. And if you take that out and close above 1850, 18,050, then, you know, you make a move towards all-time highs. Actually, if you look at the market, it's practically there. The Nifty, the Bank Nifty and the Mid-Cap Index all are within 4% of a new high. And this despite a large pocket of the market, which is Nifty IT, still being close to 30% off its 52-week highs. It also tells you the strength in the domestic market because you know if one large sector is still 30 percent off highs and the market is so close to 52 week highs which means that a lot of broader market sectors autos fmcg consumption they have done well and they are at lifetime highs uh, uh, but 
tactically because even the Nasdaq is showing some signs of reversal. My sense is today even me IT stocks may play a bit of a catch up. Uh, that doesn't change things that you know the IT itself is in a, some kind of bear market, but that may play some catch up. But on the Nifty, I think as I said, you just got to now keep trailing your stops. Uh, and uh, this is a market in which once you have an expansion, uh, you know you stay in because the the meat of the trade is you know when the market is expanding and you you will never be able to time it in terms of the top or the bottom. Uh, so just just stay. In. Let the market throw you out. Uh, that's always the best strategy. Respect the tape. Respect the ticker. That's something that we've learned always, of course. Uh, Nigel, hi, good morning. Well, uh, morning, guys. Good to be on the show. Uh, you know, Anush, one thing that I've heard you all say quite often is don't waste your time in the evening. Have your dinner, watch some sport, take it easy. You know, if you were tracking the U.S. markets last night, by the time you went to sleep around 10 o'clock, they were down, you know, yeah. 200 points or thereabouts. The Nasdaq was down, the S&P was down, and uh, the Dow as well was down. You wake up this morning and it's well in the green. You know, so, um, on a serious note, the short point you're getting is now is that the equity markets, they're coming to terms with these rate hikes that are likely to come about, at least from what we have as of now. You had uh, Fed Chair Jerome Paul, he spoke overnight as well. He reiterated, they want to fight inflation. But that's something that the street seems to have digested as of now. And, uh, you know, all brokerages, global brokerages, they are working with around 75 basis points odd. If it's 75 basis points, it appears the global markets are pretty much okay. You had the bond yields that moved up. Remember the last few days, it corrected from around 3.35%, the 10-year. It moved around 3.25, and yes, it was around that 3.3% or thereabouts. So that's par for the course as well. The ECB on expected lines there as well went and up their rates out there by close on 75 basis points. But the tone that came out there was not as hawkish, or in fact, you know, it was par for the course as well on those lines. So it appears that global equities, they're coming to terms with these rate hikes. The other asset classes as well are good from an India perspective. The dollar index, it's not running away to around that 113 odd. You know, if it broke that 110 and a half odd, then you maybe you could see it move towards around 113. So it's holding around that 109 mark, which is pretty good news. And Brent crude price is still holding below $90 per barrel. That's, uh, you know, a positive from an India perspective. How do you approach markets? Well, the FIs, they're buying in the cash market. They're short uh, in futures. That could be a blessing in disguise because the shorts could, uh, you know, be forced to, uh, uh, to close out. But now we're heading into the congestion zone. 17,900 to around 18,000. Remember, closer around a month or so ago, we went to around that 18,000 on mark. And then we have been, uh, you know, in this range, 500 points range or thereabouts. So maybe continue to remain long and your first stop loss comes in at the simple 20-day uh, moving average or uh, Sonia. Absolutely. And you know, after tracking the markets all day, right? Yeah. I don't know who is that superhero who can track the markets in the no, night. There are, there are quite it's a not few. me for sure. <laughs> I don't have that kind of energy, but well. No, definitely not me as well, Sonia. <laughs> but I'm saying, you know, if you go through WhatsApp groups and, you know, everyone's talking about how this happened, that happened. Uh, and sometimes even on a Friday evening, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty crazy actually. That's the passion, right, that people have in the markets. But uh, it just goes back to the kind of momentum that we're seeing in the equity markets right now. But lots happening on the show in the next two and a half hours. So let's kickstart the show very quickly on the equities front. First up, we have Jonathan Garner of Morgan Stanley who says that they see an increasingly attractive and investable opportunity set for Asia emerging market investors in India. They believe India is underpinned by a market-focused reform agenda and benefiting from the transition to a multipolar world. They add Hindustan Aeronautics to their Asia Pacific X Japan and GEM focus list, joining Reliance and TCS. Okay, let's get you some money market views then. Bhaskar Panda of HDFC Bank says that ECB hiked interest rates by 75 basis points with a hawkish stance. European inflation is climbing and growth is slowing down. Against this backdrop of uh, lower global growth and high inflation, oil seems to have just lower despite production cuts from OPEC+. Plus. Uh, lower oil prices are especially helpful for countries like India. Given this, he expects the USD and pair to consolidate in intraday range of 7960 to 79.80. Today is Friday, of course, so that means weekly options expiry as well on the currency futures. Okay, uh, on the bonds, Bhaskar Panda says that they have also taken cues from lower oil prices and moved lower. He expects the 10-year benchmark yield to hover between 7.1 to 7.15%. Well, Fed Reserve Chair Jerome Powell on Thursday emphasized the importance of reigning in inflation before the public gets used to higher prices. Remember, this is the Fed Chief's last scheduled public appearance before the FOMC meeting that's scheduled for later in September. Let's hear out what he had to say. Fed has and accepts responsibility for price stability, by which we mean 2% inflation over time. That, again, to your, to your question, the longer inflation remains well above target, the greater the risk that the public does begin to see higher inflation as the norm, 
And that has the capacity to really raise the costs of, of getting inflation down. So finally, history cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. I, I can assure you that my colleagues and I are strongly committed to, to this project and, and we will keep at it until the job is done. It is very much uh, our view and my view that we need to act now forthrightly, strongly as we have been doing and we need to keep at it until the job is done. Okay, that's uh, the commentary coming in. So Fed Chair Jerome Powell uh, strongly going to target inflation and do whatever it takes uh, to tame inflation, even if that means a 75 basis points rate hike in the upcoming policy. Shane Oliver, the head of investment strategy and chief economist at AMP Capital joins us now. Shane, good morning. It's great to see you this morning and uh, lovely to see that, you know, stack of books behind you. Um, you know, everyone, anyone and everyone's expecting a big rate hike this time around. How much of it do you think is priced into risky assets like equities? I think most of it is priced in at this stage. Uh, that fall we've had since the mid-August high um, adjusted to a more hawkish stance by the, by the Fed. And, of course, uh, what Powell said last night was really just a reiteration of what he said in Jackson Hole two weeks ago. So that, that's why you didn't get an overly negative reaction by markets. Uh, and um, you know, markets have adjusted to some degree. By the same token, um, the Fed is continuing to raise interest rates. So it's not as if they've gone dovish yet. They're still far from it. Um, uh, the market uh, probably wouldn't be surprised by a 75 basis point hike in September then the focus will move on to the next meeting and also the economic data. So I think we're moving from a point where inflation and interest rates are the main concern to what the impact will be on the economic outlook. And if the economic data starts to soften dramatically, then we'll see another leg down in share markets. But uh, I, I guess at the moment we're still in that in-between zone where markets are still guessing as to which way that will go. I mean, my take on it is that we came down quite sharply into into a week or so ago, a few days ago, we got oversold. Uh, now we're having a bit of a bounce from that. But it's hard to be definitive as to whether we've seen the, the bear market bottom or not. Shane, good morning. You know, of course, uh, uh, that jury is still out in the US market. But in India, if you're tracking the market, we're very close to lifetime highs and uh, we have a very strong momentum of our own. Uh, what do you make of this? Well, that's right. Uh, it is surprising. I um, mean, the Indian market has had a few gyrations along the way uh, from those highs, um, if you look at it on a, on a one-year basis. Um, and, of course, some of those gyrations have been driven by what's going on globally. Um, the Indian share market is known to be somewhat more defensive. You know, exports and imports are a relatively small share of the Indian economy compared to other markets across Asia. And it's known to trade on a relatively high PE, and that's certainly been the case through this period. And it's been a relatively strong performer. It's one of the only major markets that are in decent positive territory so far this year. Uh, and I suspect that uh, through this period of uncertainty in markets, that will probably continue. I guess the downside for India will come when the, the global bear market, if you want to call it that, comes to an end and share markets decisively rebound, then India might become a relative underperformer, um, having been an outperformer uh, through the most recent period. Uh, you know, uh, Shane, a lot of our audience will be hoping that doesn't happen because still now it's been a good ride. We are still in the green for 2022, while, uh, you know, the U.S. markets are down, the Chinese markets as well are under some pressure. But getting back to, uh, you know, the Fed's trajectory in terms of rate hikes, what are you all factoring in? 75 basis points, it appears it's almost a done deal for September. Do you think at some point of time they'll have to reverse this rate hike cycle in 2023? Are you in that camp or you believe that's not going to happen? Uh, no, I am in that camp. I, I think we'll see more hikes uh, probably into the early part of 2023. And through the latter part of 2023, we will see rate cuts. Um, obviously, a lot of uncertainty about the short term. Uh, but there are signs of light out there. If you look at uh, pipeline inflation pressures in the US, uh, business surveys, uh, whether it's the ISM or the PMIs, they all show that uh, selling prices are coming off or the pressure there is coming down. Uh, cost pressures are, are declining. Um, delivery lags are slowing or are actually improving. Um, and, of course, uh, if you look at commodity prices, part of European gas and coal doesn't look so good. Um, look at the other commodity prices. They're off their highs, including gasoline and oil. Uh, all of those things, combined with some moderation in demand, 
particularly in the labour market, which I think we will start to see in the next six months, then that will, I think, give us a decline in inflation, which will enable the Fed to, uh, to slow up and then ultimately start cutting interest rates as we go through the second half of next year. I guess the big debate in all of this is whether the US will go into recession. I think it's 50-50. Uh, I think they can still avoid it, uh, providing the inflation numbers come down quickly enough. I think, by the way, we have seen the peak in US inflation. Um, the, the other big question becomes, well, if they do go into recession, will it be a deep one or a mild one? I, I have a feeling it's going to be a relatively mild one because apart from the inflation problem, uh, the, the, the signs of excess that you normally see in the US prior to major, major recession, such as massive overinvestment or a housing boom, um, aren't there to the same degree. So I think if we do have a recession in the US, it will be a relatively mild one. So all of those things give me optimism on, say, a 12 to 18 month horizon. And uh, yeah, short answer to your question is yes, we do see the Fed starting to cut interest rates later next year. Okay, so a cut in interest rates next year by the Fed, uh, at least in the second half of uh, 2023, uh, that, that seems to be a logical estimate by a lot of uh, experts that we've spoken to. But Shane, you know, there's another narrative that because of what's happening across the globe, whether it's the US recessionary situation or even the, uh, the power crisis in Europe, a lot of outsized flows from across the globe will move into markets like India. Uh, is that your assumption as well? that we would get a lot more by way of flows because of the challenges across the globe? Well, it may. It may be the case. India is, a rel I mean, it's perverse, but it is a relatively defensive market. We've seen that recently, that global markets had a rough drop. India's done a lot better. Um, it's not as exposed to global trade. Um, it's not at the centre of tensions in Europe or even in Asia, although there are issues on the border with China, but they're not as intense as the one around runs around Taiwan. So that may benefit India on a longer term basis. And the other aspect is if these tensions with China continue to escalate over time, US companies you know, cut back their exposure to China, India will benefit from that. Uh, to some degree, as will other Asian uh, countries away from away from China. So, yeah, there are there are grounds for optimism regarding India on a longer term basis. And uh, my view has been that, uh, yeah, sure, China is on its way to becoming the world's biggest economy, or it's slowing down progress on that front. But uh, a decade or two after that, India will be the world's biggest economy. Our bet we're still talking about many decades away, but I think that is the direction we're heading in. And of course, India's. Uh, stable, relatively stable democracy um, is a big factor in that regard. Mm. Okay, so in that case, what do you see as the gains for the rest of the year? India has already outperformed. Uh, you know, most markets are, da are down about double digits this year, while India is seeing a gain. Um, would you put fresh money to work now? And if yes, over the next 12 to 18 months, what could the upside uh, gains be? Well, I, I think in the very short term, there's still downside risk for markets uh, globally, let out of the US and Europe. And if that transpires, then India will be dragged down into that. But I would be using that as a buying opportunity. History tells us that in the aftermath of US midterm elections, um, and believe it or not, this year has played out pretty much like we often see in midterm election years in the US, albeit a little bit more severe, um, you normally see markets rally. And uh, I would be looking to buy into any weakness we see over the next couple of months. And from about November uh, sometime, I think we're going to see fairly decent rallies and that will also benefit the Indian share market. The one thing I'm a little less clear on is whether the Indian share market will take a bit of a backseat as global markets start to recover or, or whether it will remain an outperformer. And I'm, I must say I'm, I'm neutral on that view. All right, uh, Shane, so a short point is that Indian markets are trading at elevated uh, multiples or valuations. But uh, we seem to be still, we are still going to outperform. Is that the view? Well, as I say, I'm, I'm a bit open on that, that front. I, I mean, there is a, there, there is a, re a reality of mean reversion here that India has been an outperformer. Yeah. It trades on a somewhat higher PE compared to many other markets around the region. Uh, for example, the, the Southeast Asia is trading on something like 11 to 14 times PE compared to about 19 times PE for India, if you compare it to 2023 earnings. So those arguments would, would suggest that once the recovery comes globally, that India will be a relative underperformer. Um, a counter argument, I guess, is some of those geopolitical issues which might continue to benefit India. So that's why some, I'm, I'm a bit neutral on that one as to whether India will be an outperformer or underperformer. I think the better way to play it would be for investors to allocate 
money into markets as we go into any more weakness over the next couple of months, um, but to do that equally between India and, and global base or on a neutral basis in terms of India versus the rest of the world. Okay, well, Shane, we will leave it at that. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in and all the best. Uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Okay, well, that's the word coming in from Shane Oliver. Yes, there could be a recessionary situation, but guess what? He's also expecting rate cuts by the Fed in the second half of the next year. So he said that a recession may in all likelihood be averted and then followed by rate cuts from the Fed. Let's do one thing. Let's slip into a quick break. Our list of top 10 stocks coming up in just a bit. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. It's the last day of the week and it looks like it's going to be a good day. I mean, the SGX Nifty is now up almost 100 odd points. We have plenty of stocks to talk about. So let's get our entire research team on board with the list of stocks. Anuj, what are you looking at today? Uh, so the tier two banks, uh, you know, I've been highlighting are clearly in some kind of uh, expansion mode. I think uh, the ones that stand out for me, uh, IDFC First Bank and IDFC, they normally tend to move in tandem and they're both very close to you know, making some multi-year breakouts. Uh, I mean, on IDFC, 70 has been perennially the level at which, you know, it just sort of uh, reverses from. On IDFC, that level has been around 53, 54. Because, uh, but, you know, the kind of momentum that these stocks are showing, I think that's something that I'll keep an eye on. Okay, all right. Uh, well, uh, thanks for that, Anuj. Uh, Sonia, coming across to you, uh, mind the reminder management, they said wait for it and the mm -hmm. launch has come about, the XUV 400. It was a big bang launch, you know. I don't know if you saw it on social no. media, but it was like... Uh, uh, you know, with all the shebang and unveiling the first electric vehicle by uh, uh, m, m right? It's the XUV 400 EV. And uh, if rumor has it, it's priced between around 14 to 15 lakhs. And if that is the case, then it's very competitive. I mean, compared to a lot of the others, it's going to be the first rival, the first proper rival to Tata Nexon. So uh, it's got a big market up in front of it because the EV market is so underpenetrated. Less than 1% of the sales currently in India come from electric vehicles. So it's got a huge uh, you know, market ahead. Also, uh, the company has said they will launch five more EV SUVs over the next five years. They're currently the number two player in the overall utility vehicle market. They have 17% share and they're looking to grow that. Now, there's another reason why, uh, you know, m, &M has done um, uh, has done a really good job by launching an EV SUV. It's because um, there is a wide GST differential between SUVs uh, and uh, the, between EVs and the IC engine. So, on an EV, you pay only 5% GST. While on an IC engine, you pay 50% GST. So I'd rather buy an electric vehicle SUV, right? Mm. Rather than buying yeah. an IC engine SUV, for, just from a GST perspective. So that's just one more angle to look at. Uh, Nomura has a buy with a target price of 1505 Macquarie has a buy with a target price of 1386 And we've seen that M&M has done exceptionally well. Uh, expect the stock to be in the green today. Mm, yes, I mean, it's been a phenomenal stock, of course, m and uh, Autos have done well, but, and Mahindra has led it. Uh, now let's uh, we'll go across to Sonal for some stocks in news. Sonal, hi, good morning. Good morning, Anuj. Well, I have a couple of stocks on my radar. Samvard and Madhusan, because they have made an acquisition, uh, the acquisition of Daimler Assembly Units. So they will be purchasing assets of frame manufacturing and assembly operations of Daimler India Commercial Vehicles. And the transaction is expected to close during quarter three of FY23 itself. Going by the volumes that they did in FY22, the revenue potential here is around 300 crore rupees for the company. GMR Power and Urban Infra were a step-down subsidiary of the company, which is GMR Varura Energy Limited. Limited has entered into definite agreements with its lenders to restructure its debt. And lastly, Equitas SFB and Equitas Holdings, that is Small Finance Bank, they have proposed scheme of amalgamation between Equitas Small Finance Bank and Equitas Holdings and this has been approved by the unsecured creditors, depositors and shareholders. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Sonal. Well, let's hop across to Vahista. She's joining to tell us about some more stocks that run the news. Morning, Vahista. Good morning, Nigel. Well, first is PNC Infratech, wherein they have signed a concession agreement between NHAI and the SPV, which was incorporated by the company, which was named Sonali Gorakhpur Highways Limited. And this is for the implementation of a ham project package. The bid project cost is approximately 1,500 crores and is expected to be constructed in 24 months 
operated for 15 years. Moving on uh, to the hotel segment, wherein the India's foreign trade policy is set to offer some incentives for the ho hotels and the tourism sector. Now, remember, this sector was severely impacted by the by the pandemic, but there's some good news also. According to estimates by Services Export Promotion Council, the travel services is set to make a strong recovery in FI23, and the potential beneficiaries could be the likes of uh, Indian hotels, lemon trees, etc. Okay, what about rain industries? You're also tracking that one this morning? Yes, that's right. Rain Carbon, which is a wholly owned subsidiary company of rain industries, uh, has said that there'll be a temporary closure of an operating unit in Europe. This is for developing additional energy-related contingency plans for its other European production units in anticipation of potential natural gas shortages and the price spikes during the upcoming winter months resulting from the unprecedented and unpredictable geopolitical environment. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, Vahista. Well, let's move on uh, then and do a quick recap of all the top stocks. Stocks with po positive news flow, they include Mahindra and Mahindra, Samvardha uh, Madhasin, GMR uh, Power, Urban Infra, you have uh, uh, Equitas Small Finance Bank, Equitas Holdings, PNC Infratech, Indian Hotels, the other hotel companies as well like Lemon Tree, uh, Tiragar Wagons, and only one stock with negative news flow. That's Rain Industries. Well, plenty of action, though, uh, in the commodity space as well overnight. My Manisha joins us to run us through all of that. Manisha, some green is what we're seeing. Some of those bombed-out metals, they bounce back. Oh, well, absolutely. It's been a good session overnight when you look at commodities. And I'll start with crude oil prices because we are off the seven-month lows here as well. While, of course, we are headed for a second weekly decline. But with Russia threatening to halt oil and gas exports to some of its buyers, that has added premium to prices. And remember, with the kind of sell-off that we've seen, we have been in oversold positions. So some speculative buying as well coming back here. Metals, as you said, yes, it has been a strong day. And Asia seems to be looking at some follow-through buying. You have steel and iron ore prices gained between 2 to 3 and a half percent as China's Zhengzhou is going to start uh, building the stalled housing projects. That would mean the construction metals will be back in demand. Copper as well surged 2.5% overnight. Asia, Shanghai has seen more buying into this. This is after workers actually as Condida have voted for a strike. So workers will partially stop work next week and completely shut it down by the end of September. The in any case are lower inventories in China and LME and it's with this work stopping as Condita being the largest copper mine in the world, there clearly is that premium that can, you can see in prices. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot for that. Of course, uh, the overarching theme has been uh, the way some of these gas, some of the gas prices have moved across the European region, uh, crude prices as well. So let's listen into some opinion coming in on both crude and gas prices from RBC Capital Markets' Helena Croft. Listen in and we'll come back. The natural gas story remains, I think, the most important economic story because Europe is really facing a serious economic crisis. If Vladimir Putin makes good on his threats to basically shut off Europe in terms of gas supplies, it's going to be challenging for these countries to make it through winter if it is a cold winter. So I do think that Vladimir Putin is playing a very serious game of brinkmanship with Europe on natural gas. You know, market participants are very concerned about recession. They're looking at the China story with continued COVID lockdowns, weak economic data. And they're basically saying the outlook on the demand side may not be great. The supply picture, we have this U.S. SPR release. It's going to be winding down. The question is, come December 5, are we going to have serious economic sanctions that pull Russian barrels off the market? We had this OPEC meeting on Monday. They did this micro cut, but they said, look, we're willing to do more. We stand ready. Will Saudi Arabia essentially do a massive short squeeze if they see prices moving further down? I think OPEC is a very important wild card to see, pay attention to. Well, time to slip into a short break. But up next, Sanjeev Basin of IAFL Securities will be joining in. We'll be discussing a lot of fundamental stock analysis. Later on, we'll be connecting with Anand Roy of Star Health and Allied Insurance to talk about the life insurers growth outlook. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Uh, well, the SGX Nifty is indicating that we'll have another positive start. Not that it, it matters anymore, honestly speaking. It's been such a strong market and, and if, uh, you know, if, uh, the, the market perhaps had a bit of a shakeout on, on Wednesday, that's it. And uh, after that, it's just been on Tuesday rather and uh, then just been moving higher. We have Sanjeev Bhasin now joining us. He's director at IFL Securities. Sanjeev, hi, good morning. Uh, good to talk to you as always. Uh, 18,000 is here. Uh, you can smile now. Uh, this was your target on the on the Nifty, right? Uh, it's come maybe sooner than you would have expected, right? Uh, uh, what next? Yeah, good morning. So, Anuj, uh, arguably we've had the best two months in the last 12 months. And who's complaining? So, 18,000 is just a number. You can see there's a humongous feeling of left out. So, 19, 20, 21, we could be headed anywhere. India is a huge outperformer and I think the Fed policy... All the external macros will be priced in by the end of September. And I'm looking for a global rally, given the pent-up demand globally and India being an outperformer. Okay, Sanjeev, hi. Good morning. Uh, I mean, you can see it all around, right? Even in the markets, there's uh, leadership coming through from a lot of pockets, whether it's autos, consumption, banks. Uh, who or which are the stocks you think could lead the next leg of the rally? Yeah, good morning. So, Sonia, <laughs> such is the world of stocks which tell you that despair and ecstasy go hand in hand. And if you could buy the despair, you are laughing to the ecstasy now. Well, it's just started. Auto numbers are telling you that there is a very, very strong pent-up demand. Hotels, uh, travel, tourism, banks are laughing their way on the credit side. Look at how the mid-cap banks have done. Cement, you forgot to mention Ambuja hitting a new high. That was my last to topic when I came to you on your show last time when 365 was the open offer and the price was much below that. And, and I think that uh, whole, whole host of OEMs, so collectively the market has now enough pillars to take you up. Uh, even IT and uh, metals to some extent would be uh, something which I could be looking out to uh, you know, drive the markets higher. Mm. Hi, Sanjeev, and, uh, you know, good to hear your bullish commentary continue as well. And, uh, you know, good when you stick your neck out when uh, there's a lot of despair out there. So you've got that called right. Uh, I wanted to, a quick update. You, know, talk, you spoke about Ambuja Cements. Cement has done very, very well. But what do you do from here? Is there still pockets that you would look to buy, the larger or the smaller names? Yeah, good morning, Nigel. The point is not uh, putting your neck out. The point is being consistent. Mm. Consistency pays off, and if I was consistent from 15 and a half, then at 18 and a half, I'll be more consistent on a lighter note. Well, Ultratech, 114 million tons of capacity. It is the largest player. Ambuja ACC combined have 58 million, and Ultratech numbers, margins are all ex, you know going to exceed targets. So at 6,900, I would still put my money on Ultratech for a target of eight and a half thousand, and we think. You know, the way construction, the way CapEx uh, is picking up, uh, Ultratech will be one stock to be washed out for. Okay, Sanjeev, uh, in the recent past, you've been extremely bullish on the tier two banks. Uh, you know, have seen decent moves in some of these names. Uh, uh, you know, especially the couple of PSU ones. Even in the private space, we've seen big moves in federal and city union bank. From a risk-reward point of view, is this still a good space to be in? Yeah, yeah, and so very well spotted. You know, actually, if you saw the uh, components of some of the banks, I, I mean, of course, ICICI, but uh, look at IDFC first, look at uh, City Union, like you said, look at Federal, they have all, and look at Bank of Baroda, it's hitting new highs. Who thought that PSUs uh, will be the, you know, flavor of the day, month, and year? And I still think there is steam there. Uh, I'll give you a dark horse. I think Union Bank, uh, and PNB, I mean, they are, uh, you know, hated stocks, but uh, the, the managements themselves are saying that we are sitting on excess cash and our uh, lending season, uh, uh, you know, actions or uh, quantity is going to be huge. So, so take it in a pinch of salt. I've been holding PNB all the way from 34 and recommending, but Union Bank is my dark horse. 35, 36 was where we entered. We are not going to exit till 75 or 80 on uh, Union Bank. That could be my dark horse on a small ticket size. But if you want to stay with the larger ones, then I obviously ICICI, Kotak are two of our favorite picks. 
bank abroad and state bank on the uh, PSU side. Oh, I take your point. I mean, SBI is sitting at a fresh record high, right? And if you look at the chart, in the last three months, it's gained, what, 15% SBI. And in the last six months, it's a 24% gain that SBI has seen. So PSU banks are coming back and how. But um, I, I just want you to stay on, Sanjeev, because we're going to discuss the insurance space now. And this is a space that also that's heating up, right? So I want your thoughts. We have the management of Star Health uh, after the August update. So the insurer is seeing muted growth compared to what they clocked in pre-COVID. And this has also resulted in a gradual market share loss for them. So to discuss the outlook, Anand Roy, who is the managing director at Star Health and Allied Insurance, joins us now. Uh, Ananda, good morning. And that's the first question, right? Compared to what you saw in COVID and even compared to the rest of the industry, your growth in the last few months has been a bit sluggish. And you've chipped off a little bit on your market share as well. What do you see as the sustainable growth for the company? Good morning and thanks for having me on your show. Uh, so uh, at the headline uh, uh, growth numbers, if you see definitely Star Health, is having a muted growth as compared to others but that is part of the strategy as i've always uh, as i've told earlier because uh, our focus this year is on the retail business and uh, we are going a bit conservative on the group health insurance piece where we are losing market share uh, but that is part of the strategy to improve the overall uh, performance of the organization on the retail side you know we continue to grow much stronger than the industry we are uh, we have increased our market share uh, over the last uh, year from, by about uh, 200 basis points in the retail uh, segment. So we continue to remain focused on the retail side and uh, I think uh, that's part of our plan. Plus, what is the market share exactly? Because as per the data that we have, in June of 2021, you had about 4.9% market share. That's actually come down to 4.4% overall uh, in August of this year. So you said you've increased retail market share. Can you just break it up for us? What is the overall market share and in the retail side as well? Yes, yeah, Sonia. So that's the overall market share which you're talking about for the entire health insurance business, uh, where we have, uh, you know, the market share has gradually reduced a bit for, because of a loss in uh, group health insurance portfolio. But on the retail side, we have a 32% market share uh, as of July numbers. The August numbers have not yet been published in terms of the breakup of the various segments of the business. But as of July numbers, we have grown our market share from 30 to 32 percent uh, on a YOY basis. And we continue to remain focused on that. So, Anand, you know, in the last few quarters, uh, last two or three quarters, I'm guessing your market share has moved from around 27, 28 percent all the way to around 32 percent uh, uh, on the retail health side. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Absolutely. All right. What about growth for the year? I recall you telling us that on a blended basis, growth will be close to around 18 percent for the year. But on the retail side, it could be around 20 to around 25 percent or Tell us what's the growth on the retail side uh, and also how much of this growth will be because of price increases, high uh, single digits? Yeah, so the growth on the retail side continues to be upwards of 20% as we speak. Uh, I think uh, we are well on track to achieve our growth target of uh, between around 20 to 25%. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the growth is coming very strong uh, on the retail side from various channels. Uh, agency continues to be our mainstay. But we are also seeing very, very high growths in our uh, new channels like bank assurance and digital. And I think, you know, overall things are looking very, very positive. As far as, uh, you know, uh, on the, uh, what, what was your second question? How much of this price, price right? increases? Yes. Will it be, it'll be 8% yeah. or, or in that vicinity? Yeah, so price increases, uh, we do take price increases uh, depending on the portfolio of the business. But uh, recently, we have taken an increase in one of our lead, one of our products called the Star MediClassic, which is an individual uh, health insurance plan. Mm -hmm. uh, price increases typically constitutes about uh, 7 to 8% of our uh, overall increase in the numbers. Mm. So this 20 to 25% overall growth that you're talking about, can you break it up for us? What's the current distribution mix? And uh, between direct sales and bank assurance sales, where do you see the outsized growth? Yeah, so agency continues to be our mainstay of business. Almost uh, close to 80% of our business comes from agency. And uh, the bank assurance and the digital piece is constituting the balance 20%. Uh, uh, we are seeing high growth in uh, the bank assurance and digital space. By, uh, we are growing at more than 50% in these areas. And the agency con uh, continues to grow strongly between 20 to 20, 22% odd. Anand, so that's what we are seeing right now. All right. Anand, uh, uh, if you could give us a number, how many policies do you typically sell in a fiscal? Maybe in the last year? 
So we typically sell, last year we sold about 75 lakh policies covering around 2 crore lives. Okay. Each policy, you know, is a typical family floater plan, has two, uh, three members. Okay. So that's the size of our retail business. This is excluding all the group businesses that we do. Okay, you know, the reason I ask you is because suddenly there's this, uh, you know, there's likely to be dematerialization uh, of insurance policies. And uh, we mm -hmm. understand, you know, my colleague Yash, he tells us that maybe the cost of this dematerialization could be nearly around 60 rupees per policy. Uh, do you think we should work with a similar number out there? And this cost will be borne by y'all? Uh, is that is that likely to happen? Also, on the flip side, you'll be saving on printing costs, delivery costs. So how does that work out? Uh, you know, net-net, what will be the increase in cost? So I think, you know, uh, this is a uh, positive step. Uh, so the net increase in cost, we, uh, we have to yet to see how the, you know, the, the discussions pan out, whether the cost will be borne by the insurance company or some of it can be shared with the customer, we'll have to work that out. Mm. But I think uh, overall, in the larger interest of the entire industry, this is a very, very positive step because insurance, uh, you know, policies uh, have to be dematerialized so that easy access is available to the customer at a time of a claim or any services required. Mm. I think, you know, this should be done, okay. irrespective of the cost. Okay, got that. There are also talks of the regulator considering uh, issuing a composite license. Uh, at any point in time, would you look to get into the life insurance space or any other segment like motor insurance? Sonia, so we have a very strong distribution established across the country, very, very granular and very unique in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, we are looking at the health insurance space as the focus area because there is mm -hmm. still so much of work to be done in this business. Uh, we have not thought of, you know, any other lines of business, but if the regulations do change, we will evaluate it at that point of time. Mm. All right. Uh, Thanks a lot for joining us. That's uh, Star Health. Uh, uh, it had a very sharp correction and equally sharp recovery. I mean, if that six-month chart uh, would come up again for you, there it is. Uh, you know, huge decline and then even bigger bounce. Uh, Sanjeev, have you tracked it, Star Health? Uh, no, no, I don't. I, we are, our top holding is SPI Life, followed by HDFC Life, and we want to stay with the leader. So, okay. so we are focused on these two insurance companies. We think that insurance is a no-brainer in the sense that if you are looking to do a fixed deposit or get returns, you'd rather do a SIP in uh, one of in both of these uh, private insurers because there's a very, very long way ahead given the population and given the demographics of how many people are insured. So their premium collection, their gross net value asset, all point out that SBI Life and HDFC Life will be the leaders mm. in this space for many, many years to come. Okay, what about Lombard? ICSA Lombard? Yeah, Lombard is again a pick, uh, but it has been a little volatile. But like I said, we have avoided that. We want mm. to stay with both these plays, and these are two of our picks. But ICICI Lombard is a fairly okay. The stock has actually underperformed in the recent few months. Mm. And uh, I think uh, the market share gain and the... You know, the clarity on the policy now from insur life insurance also being able to sell other products has put a little bit of damper on uh, Lombard. Okay. Uh, Sanjeev, you briefly mentioned, you know, the auto sales and how they're picking up. m and uh, launched, uh, unveiled a new electric vehicle yesterday. And incidentally, it's World Electric Vehicle Day today. Uh, so there's so much traction happening here. But from a stock-specific point of view, what would be your top pick now? So, Sonia, let me take you about a year and year quarter, uh, one year quarter back. If you remember when there was doom and dust, 70 was my Ashok Leland favorite. Ashok Leland is hitting new highs. Ashok Leland is going to 200 rupees. m and is going to 1500. And my dark horses are going to be Mothersan, Sumi and Bosch. Bosch is headed to 23,000 and Mothersan to 170. It's a come bonus share. Uh, these are four of my top picks. I also am overweight on iShare Motor. And I think TVS Motor has been the star. So you can sum up these and I think you'll make the perfect basket. Mm. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, which sector according to you has run ahead of itself? Nigel, there will always be optimism and pessimism at its highest. And uh, you can sense the feeling of left out being so large that certain stock sectors will outperform. Recently, the case to point is... Uh, just a case like a stock like NDTV. You know, when I joined my career, when I came back from Hong Kong, I was a consultant in NDTV. And uh, in 2011-12, uh, luckily, in the, some of the, uh, uh, you know, payment came by way of uh, some stocks. So at 30 rupees, I accumulated and still had 6,000 stocks. 
and imagine what a bounty it, it, these 6,000 stocks turned out to be. So, you know, there is a lot of left out feeling. You've seen the same case as the stocks run up far ahead of open offers. Look at the Ambuja case. So these valuations are stressed and so is the Adani group. But Adani group as a whole, even though multiples are very ahead and most people have missed out and are waiting for crashes, those may not or may not materialize. In the short run, maybe some of the FMCG stocks yeah. look overpriced. But given the consumption spend and the spending, uh, you know, euphoria, which will unleash, I think they will continue to rule the premiums, which they are uh, at. Sanjeev, you hit many such jackpots like NDTV. You are a rich man, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> and... 6,000 shares, Anuj, come on. 6,000 is nothing for uh, okay. people like you. <laughs> I'm coming to Delhi. I'm hoping that, you know, you will uh, you will take me for, for, for a treat at, at your restaurant, I guess. Uh, you have you, that... Uh, Array, you're, <laughs> you're, you're all most welcome. You're most welcome. It would be my pleasure and delight to, uh, you know, get you some of the best butter chicken and uh, tikka at my son's restaurant. Oh, looking, looking oh, forward wow. to that, sir. That's a good way to start our weekend, right? I mean, at least expect some butter chicken and chicken tikka. Yeah. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Sanjeev. Yes, yeah, Sanjeev, thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for joining us. And, you know, I have, I have to give it to you. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, you, you were consistent. Uh, I, I know you were trolled a lot when the market was down. Uh, but, you know, you stuck your neck out about 18,000. And, uh, uh, of course, you know, lo and behold, we are at 18,000 today. So, uh, you know, uh, I think you deserve a congratulations for, for that call. Thanks a lot. For joining us, Sanjeev. Thank you, Anuj. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Nigel. Wish you all the best. And you are all most uh, welcome to any time in Delhi to come and eat the best butter chicken again and double invite. <laughs> wow, checking out the rates. Now. Maybe you can book the ticket sometime and join, uh, join you out there, Sanjeev. Thanks so much uh, for joining in and filling us in on your views in the markets as well as extending that advice as well. All right, for the time, we can slip in a short break. Come back, continue our focus on markets. We'll have Mitesh Thakkar as well as Shrikant Shah They'll be joining in to give us some technical trading ideas. Welcome back. Uh, well, uh, the market's been on some kind of steroids and uh, it's you know, uh, one of those markets where you just have to sit in and let the market do the rest and it's been doing that for you. Uh, 17,924 now on the SGX Nifty Futures. Mitesh Thakkar and Shrikant Chauhan joining us. Good morning. Mitesh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, rinse and repeat, right? Just buy and sit tight and, uh, you know, on every dip just add. But uh, for how long can this trend continue and what will be the targets here? Good morning, I mean, it's very difficult to guess how long and, you know, we can always have, make an educated guess about the targets, but for the timing, I think it looks like the signals are clearly on the upside. So, till that changes, and that could be uh, at least a few weeks, because the bank nifty is looking very interesting between the two indices. I, you know, we've spoken about this bank nifty getting into all-time highs. I think it's on the verge of doing that. Once that happens, I think I would look at a minimum a test of 41,800, which is the uh, intra-week high, but I think eventually the move above 40,300, zone should see the bank duty attempt even 44,500 to about 45,000. So very positive setup on the short and the medium term chart. I think this rally will extend for quite some time. So stay long. On the Nifty, you know, we've had targets of around uh, 17,965 to 18,000. That remains an important psychological level as well as the earlier pivot. But I think once that is crossed, 18,150 to 200 should be the next immediate target if we are talking about two to, uh, two to three sessions. Okay, Shrikant Chauhan is also with us. Shrikant, hi, good morning. Uh, your thoughts on the market? It's a one-month high and it's only been trending upwards. What are the next levels to watch and what are the individual stocks you're looking at? Uh, Shrikant, I think you're on mute. Good morning, Sonia. Good morning, Anuj. Uh, I think, see, one thing is very clear that the markets are forming higher top, higher bottom. And after consolidating uh, at crucial levels of uh, 17,800, 17,700, we saw eventually markets crossing uh, its upward boundary. So the next level to watch out for would be 18,300, 18,350 in the near term. No doubt that 18,000 is going to act as major resistance. But the way the market has spent time close to 17,800, I think... Uh, the markets are now going to cross 18,000 easily and we are, we are going to see the levels of 18,300. So in case if there is any correction, we should look for adding some long position. But if there is a positional view, then even at current levels, we should be buyer uh, with a target of 18,300. And for the bank nifty, 40,700 to 40,000. 
900 sort of levels. Okay. All right. And Srikanth, you want to fill us in with a couple of your stock trading picks? Good morning, Nigel. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there are a number of stocks because the broader market is doing well. So in that space, we like uh, GNFC, uh, which is currently trading at uh, 755, 756. Uh, yesterday, it closed around those levels. The next level to watch out for would be 790 to 800. So it's a buy at current levels with a stop loss at uh, 745 on the downside. And the other stock which we like is from the financial space and Canada Bank is on our watch list. Here we are expecting stock to move towards 260, 265 in the near term, but uh, 255, 260 is possible maybe today or tomorrow. So it's a buy at current level with a stop loss around 240. Okay. And Mitesh, what are you buying and selling? So uh, it's an all buy list. Uh, GNFC is the common uh, stock on the list. Uh, that's a buy for me as well. The uh, stop at seven forty five for targets of seven seventy eight. Couple of banking names. I say say a bank is a buy with a stop at eight eighty seven for targets of nine twenty five. Axis Bank is a buy with a stop at seven seventy one for targets of eight hundred. And Asian Paints complete the uh, list. That's a buy with a stop below thirty four thirty for a first target of thirty five ten. Okay, let's do one thing. Let's slip into a quick break. When we come back, we'll have the pre-opening rates. Later, we'll also connect with Amit Agarwal of Raymond to discuss their business and the demand outlook. Stay tuned.